Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, I am Julien Pivoto. I work uh, at Inuits and I have been working uh, since 2011 in this company, uh, mainly uh, as a consultant, which means that uh, I do see a lot of different infrastructure, a lot of different projects, and uh, I'm usually uh, most of my time in long term missions. Uh, but still, I, I get to see a lot of different things, and that's why I wanted to share with you a bit about my experience and uh, where we are now, uh, according to me, but most from the technical side. Uh, I have worked with Puppet uh, for a long time, like uh, six, seven years. Uh, since two or three years, we have got a customer project with Ansible. Now I'm doing working at a customer when I just do uh, Ansible things. Uh, also a bit of Terraform, and I'm also contributing to uh, MGMT, so James Project for Next Generation uh, Management. So at Inus, we have projects from uh, big, small, uh, large uh, enterprises, governments, uh, some uh, non-governmental uh, as well. So we really have uh, from the really small infrastructure to the very large infrastructure, and that's very interesting to see uh, how they tackle differently the automation problem. So once upon a time, uh, when we, I started to work, I was told, okay, you know, software is kind of easy to do, so you have a package, usually it was an RPM package, a Debian package, and you, uh, it defines where you should put the configuration, where the files are, and you can do uh, sanity checks on those packages, you can install them uh, on uh, different machines, and you will always get the same code. Then, once you have your package, obviously, uh, you have your configuration, which is uh, written into files, which are next to your package, and which enables you to like configure your service, uh, configure your package, so that it behaves differently on different hosts, and you can actually do something useful with your package. Then you need to usually start a service, like, okay, I have my package, I wanted to do something, so I just start the service and I will uh, check if the service is running and I, then, I can then move on and my software is hopefully deployed. So, and that was called the PCS pattern. Like, uh, you can do it manually, even that pattern, you can go to a server, do a human install, you can uh, do it very easily, so yeah. And sometimes, even at that moment, the package was just a tarball. And then we moved into a way where that PCS pattern was automated, where you started to use a package manager for all the things. You got your uh, dependency uh, package and version as well, like you would not depend on random version of uh, that and that library. And you did run some sanity check be before running the package, and you can also check if the files have been changed. Like, did someone patch on Sybil on my CI server because that functionality well, is not in the version I want to use, but apparently someone was smart enough to change that. Uh, and also the, pat the, the PCS pattern at that time, it gives us, okay, that file come exactly from that package and not from uh, another package. I, I don't know the version of that file, that's really important. And uh, that version control, that, that uh, PCS pattern enables you to, to know, okay, that file is coming from that uh, package and that version. The configuration also evolved to be like templated so that you could put it in your config management tool and uh, you could uh, mod model it and have the same across multiple servers or the same behavior even if it's not the same exact content because like a uh, web server will not be configured the same way on 10 different servers but uh, the fact that uh, we did uh, template the configuration enable us to have like some consistency and that you don't need to look at the 10 of them to know exactly how uh, they were implemented. So that was really important as well. So the config management tools, uh, they are quite old. So yesterday we have seen that CF Engine is 25 years, CF and Puppet are yeah, more or less 10 years, Ansible more or less 5 years. And uh, there are more coming, there are more like this, it's also salt, it's also MGMT, so you have a lot of choices when it comes to config management. One of the things that I really like about them is that they can just abstract the operating system, like you don't need to, read, to write something which is specific for uh, Debian, you don't need to write 
something which is specific to uh, Red Hat. You can just say, okay, I want that package to be installed. I want that service to be installed. And that's something that we had from the very beginning of Puppet. Like, we don't care about where we run the infrastructure, just install that package and uh, it will just be fine. And then at a certain point, okay, we could not uh, have a downtime anymore when we uh, started release a new uh, upgrade of your software because yeah, you, you need to be up 24 seven uh, and users come uh, all the time. So you need to start doing some uh, rolling restart, rolling upgrades. And there are multiple ways to do that to achieve the fact that you can safely upgrade your software without breaking your users and without uh, having a downtime. One way is to uh, build that into your application, like, okay, now we are, uh, we have code enough, we have the libraries, we have everything we need to do like uh, in-place updates. That means that it is up to the developers to implement that in the software. Like uh, you need to be able to offer an API which can be supported by two versions. You need to take care of the data migration. Sometimes you need to work with the reverse proxies. And you need also to get your application to talk to each other and to be able to talk to each other even if they are in two different versions. And if you think it's difficult, well, so for example, one of uh, the examples that can do that nowadays is uh, Elasticsearch 6. So that version of Elasticsearch can just do uh, a rolling upgrade uh, in place, which means that you don't need a downtime to upgrade your Elasticsearch cluster. Uh, it will just work. Even across uh, major releases, it just works. And the other way to do that, to do the rolling upgrades, is just to say, okay, I don't want to bother with the uh, development uh, process. I just want to have that built in into the platform. So I want my platform to enable me to uh, do that orchestration and uh, that uh, rolling upgrade. And in most of the cases, it just means that you need to configure reverse proxies. Some of the reverse proxies are uh, are kind of uh, dumb. What I mean for that is that they still have a static configuration. And even for those uh, reverse proxies like uh, Apache, which is not really good at uh, service discovery, you can just say, okay, I will remove you from the Apache configuration and then uh, some config management tool can wait for all the connection between the front end and the back end to be uh, closed. So that's the drain that we see uh, in Ansible, for example, and then you can just safely restart your service. And then you can do that uh, on all the machines, one after each other, it's very easy. And it works with any reverse proxy pattern that you would have. But then the next step was that we did see uh, arrive uh, some clever reverse proxies. So reverse proxies that actually know what's going on. They actually know uh, service registry. They know, okay, the service are registered to me and I can go and check if they are alive. If they are alive, I will send them some traffic. If they are not alive, I just remove them. I forget about them. And that's still uh, tools like console that enables you to do that, but they are already a few years old now and they work pretty, pretty well. So uh, that's really uh, something that has been used for years. And then you can also be uh, in the middle. Like, you can uh, use a solution like console template to populate your Apache configuration and it will remove and uh, add the nodes to the backend as needed. Then your software needs to be deployed somewhere. And you want deployments that are safe, quick, and often. Like, you don't want to deploy twice a year, so you want to deploy uh, as needed, as needed by the business, as needed by, by the security of this, anything. And even there, we have a lot of choices for the config management tools. Nowadays, you have tools that will uh, be uh, run every X minutes on your infrastructure, like Puppet, or you can just push new configuration on demand with patterns like the Ansible pattern. Uh, you can even choose if you want to be imperative, declarative. Both models exist, they are both very alive, and everyone uh, is involving in both of them. And you also see people which Fine, okay, uh, that tool is great, but I still need some feature of the other tool, so I just use the other tool to like orchestrate the first one and then uh, launch the other tool. And it works pretty well. 
And then we start also seeing event-driven tools that will just react to what is going on live, like uh, you delete a file and they will add it back. Uh, you have uh, another, you have some, an event in your info, they will just react on that infrastructure event directly. You also need some good CI systems, like not something that runs in your laptop, but something that uh, your tool can, your team can see and run. And those CI systems, there are a lot of them, and there are a lot of them which are very mature nowadays, and uh, they are kind of alive, almost all of them. So it's really important that uh, we have enough tools in the toolkit to enable uh, uh, us to like have a proper development environment when everyone can see the test, everyone can uh, launch a build, everyone can safely go and uh, see what's going on in a reference implementation, which means that you don't need to go on everyone's laptop, set up Maven tree that I don't know what, because that's what the only stuff that works. No, you have your CI server and this is what you should uh, look at this is really where the code runs and if it passes the CI then it will just run and a bunch of tools do that uh, whether they're on the cloud or on premise you have a lot of choices and nowadays they also tend to be very good with config management or uh, development process so like a uh, project like Jenkins uh, they are putting a lot of efforts to be nice with config management tools so that we can reproduce them and you can really go build and prove and change them Another thing is that uh, we have nowadays is regarding the runtime. Like, you know, you have that application that needs Java 6, Java 7, or uh, PHP 5.6, PHP 5.7. And how do you test on those REST runtimes? Because, yeah, you know, in traditional package management, you can just have one of them, or you don't have a lot of choices. You need multiple machines, but now we have something called containers. And containers, but not only Docker. So LXC, system DNS uh, even true, it can be used for all that. So we have solutions for a long time that just enable us to test across multiple, via, uh, multiple versions of multiple runtime platforms. Uh, so something like the GVN, you can also bundle it. You can uh, have multiple GVM installed on, your, on uh, your CI system. So it's really easy to do that. Then there is a question, okay, when do I run my code? So a few years ago, you would make a VM or you would install a, a machine and that, that's also a problem that has been solved. You have a software like Foreman that can just uh, provision bare metal uh, servers and just automate them uh, very easily and you don't need to take care about any manual step after that. So that's also something that it's really great, really important nowadays that even the bare metal stuff is something that is so for multiple years already. If you don't have enough power, if you want for some reason, you can also uh, go to the cloud and then get machines on demand and you can uh, use tools that will also help you to do that in an automated way. So if you want more power at certain time, you can just power up uh, an extra virtual machine and it will just work. Um, out of the box, so that's really nice. If that's not enough, if you are not, uh, if you don't have enough technology, you can still go for other patterns, just like Kubernetes, when you just define your application, you set your requirements basically, and they will just go fetch the disk, fetch the, everything that's needed for your application to run, and they will make sure that it runs and that it continues to be run. And then you also have some helpers to do the reading upgrades. That kind of thing is also built into the, to those tools. The same for uh, Mesos and Nomad are also the same tools, like. It's a new tool that did not exist like uh, 10 years ago that you can now use to solve your problems. And I'm not even speaking about Kubernetes 1.9, but even the Kubernetes from two, three years ago was already good at that. If that's not enough, then you can go serverless because, yeah, you know, you don't want to compile your Golang code yourself. Uh, but more seriously, uh, you can even abstract the, the server part and just say, okay, I don't want to take care about that anyway. I just want to write my code and push it and just have it run uh, on demand when it's really needed. The monitoring tools, it's also something that's very interesting. And when I've seen a lot of changes in the last years, so like we have uh, gone from tools that were really uh, not flexible, that were uh, difficult to set up, and now they 
Most of them just offer an API or check and just use other, other software's API. Uh, you, you have also the choice, do you want to pull your metrics, push your metrics? Uh, but at the end, it's always uh, to go to the more simple monitoring systems. Like when you see uh, systems like Graphite, like Prometheus, it's very easy to understand, it's very easy to put that in place, like sending pa TCP packet with just uh, the name of a metric and a value, or just exposing a small HTTP server with some values. It's very easy, and uh, what I really like about them is that you can mix both technical and non-technical uh, metrics, so that's really interesting. But what I have told you is something that uh, we have been doing for many years, like we didn't invent Kubernetes yesterday, we didn't invent Puppet yesterday, the same for Ansible and all the other tools. We have these tool, those tools for a lot of different years, but still, we still do config management camp. So all of that power, uh, what did we fail? So if you look back at the DevOps culture uh, definition that was made in 2010, uh, it was, okay, DevOps is about culture automation, measurement and sharing, like, uh, this was a pretty good definition of DevOps, like, what should you do to improve yourself, to improve your deployment, to improve the way you work. But the point is that a lot of people, they just get like, okay, DevOps means automation, right? And if I do automation, I do DevOps. And when you start doing that, then uh, the guy who is in charge of the CI system, the guy who is in charge of the build, the guy which is in charge of the repositories, uh, it will just be like the DevOps. Like, are you a DevOps? Yeah, yeah, I'm a DevOps engineer, I do the DevOps stuff, I know everything, and people uh, just replace the wall of confusion between the devs and the ops by a DevOps team or people who just are supposed to to do everything and to fix everything. And this is a DevOps, like you can work fast, which means that you can work then and night to get things done. Uh, and when you work, it's so generic, it can be used for any use case. And that's very nice, yeah, that's what DevOps do. They do stuff that are so great, you can reuse them, abuse them all the time, uh, even if they did made, made it in five minutes. Um, you also need to have stuff that will auto will auto scale and still you are alone to do that. Um, and yeah, also documentation is important, so you also write a lot of documentation because you know you are DevOps and you have uh, all the time to do documentation and the test and everything for everything that you do. There is also the cloud that is there. Uh, but some people just don't want to use it because you know they need to use the budget they have uh, to buy hardware or they really go to the cloud but they won't tell anyone because you know it's not really allowed so let's just get those few VMs on the cloud and don't tell anyone. Uh, they will just say okay we go for the cloud so that we don't need operations anymore, we don't need anyone to manage the stuff that is in the cloud. Yeah, it will magically happen and just the dev can take care of that. Uh, or just like, yeah, we want to go for the cloud, let's go tomorrow, like it's so easy, everyone says the cloud is easy, so we don't need a plan, we don't need to think about it, let's just go for the cloud just now. Or people also want to make very hard compromises, like, yeah, we can go for the cloud, but we want to keep the data inside. We don't want to uh, put our databases in the cloud in any way. We, we just, yeah, that's not working neither. So, what I told you about operation is we like people think that uh, someone can know how to fine tune a MySQL database knows how to package a, a Debian file, a RPM file, and also it means uh, what uh, Java lang no such field there are means in other cases. And also when you go to that, you cannot go on holidays, you cannot sleep, because yeah, you know so much, you are so uh, impossible to replace. We still see a lot of bash thing as well, like people still think that bash is sexy and they still write bash scripts that no one can read. 
Uh, even uh, the Pashki that I have written five years ago, I cannot read them anymore, even three years ago. And people still think, okay, but you know, we have all that Bash stuff. Yeah, that's automation, right? And we have all those cron jobs and we change them twice a day because we don't want the same at the, in, the, in the day and the night because, yeah, you know what I think, tracers are changing, that kind of things. Yeah, so we need, we need to use something in the bash to do that. And we need package manager when you have bash as well because, yeah, you know, you can just set into files, you can do anything you want and it will just work. You can do curl, wget, get and it will just work. Another thing I've been uh, fighting against is like you have what the sales people want, like they, what they will say to the customers, like you will get that, oh yes, of course, uh, we will make you we make that happen, yeah, for tomorrow, yeah, it will happen. Uh, and then you have the tech leads, they know, uh, they know what's inside the infrastructure, they know how to improve and they know what they want to improve. And uh, sales people and tech leads, they don't always agree, well, they almost never agree, and that creates a lot of frustration and that you cannot improve your own infrastructure because you are between those two, uh, those two people and some of them tell you to do something, the other wants to do something else and at the end you don't want to, uh, you don't want to, be, uh, to lose your customers because you promise them what uh, they cannot have. It's the same pattern with the proof of concept. Who has already done a proof of concept and uh, say, okay, let's make something that barely works so that we can demo that to the customer. And then uh, the day after, okay, the customer agreed and we can go in production like next week. But it was a proof of concept that you made in a hurry just to see, okay, that might work if we put some effort in it, but people just are the first part of the sentence. And then you start having uh, exceptions. Like uh, people will just say, okay, for that environment we need this or we need that, which is very specific to that customer, but still we will put it in config management, we will put it uh, in all our code base and we will make exceptions all over the place if then else, everything. And every time you do that, you add complexity, which is, yeah, might not be needed because it's just for one customer. And you just say to the customer, you know, we are not doing that, we are not that product. So you should try to find a solution to fix your problem, just having us hosting that because yeah, you know, it's not the way we work. There is also that thing, you know, that thing called open source. So we rely a lot on third party software, we rely a lot on uh, uh, libraries and yeah, you know, it must be open source, but yeah, it's more important that it's free. And uh, you know, we don't have time to contribute, so we just take GBoss and we will, during five years, make our own patches to our own GBoss and not contribute them because you know, yeah, who knows? Maybe it's no one else has the same bug, so why do we, why should we bother to uh, patch it back and send it back to the community? And also when something is not going well, people just go to the community and say, yeah, this is not going well. And it's also uh, not great for the community because you know, you just know when things are not going well. And that's when you hear about people and you will never have people that actually say, hey, we are using this, it's really great. And we want to help you, we want to contribute with you because you know, half of our business is maybe based on your software. And upstream committees also, uh, also are not that easy to approach nowadays because you know you have being English, Google Groups, blog posts, like IRC website, or do you find good information, relevant information? And also uh, you have some uh, products that just change the, the technical stack but keep the same name. And also that's very really difficult for uh, us to explain to people, you know, that product that we want to use is not the same that four years ago. It's a completely different tool chain. Uh, it's a different uh, stack behind that. So don't take a look at those. 2012 blog post about it because it's very deprecated and no one is doing that uh, anymore. Uh, so then you can um, improve the way you choose your tooling. So uh, there are a lot of uh, tools which are used by a lot of people which are still very, very stateful. And they try to just take them and put them in modern uh, tools like Kubernetes, like um, 
like, like they need a state, they need a disk, they won't work without that. They cannot work with a read-only disk, so you really need to take care of them. And some of them even take their configuration from REST APIs. Like, why would you choose to use such a tool nowadays? Everyone is using uh, text configuration, and now you just like, yeah, but for that, you know, it's a cluster, so yeah, you need to use REST API to configure it. But then when you try to use that REST API, it will just not understand a put command or a patch command. You will need to use the very specific way of doing things. But still, a lot of people just say, yeah, this is great, this is the future, a lot of people are using that. Yeah, that's not an excuse. So you are also responsible for the tool that you choose uh, and you should really go and use the one that fit you the most and not the one that you think are the most used in the business. CI systems, a lot of them are still like not automated, which means that well, you get the, ma the Maven version of the day or just no one will look at that, you know, that Jenkins software that has been installed three years ago, it's always red. And guess what? Well, the disk is full, so I will disable those three jobs that apparently yeah, no one needs them. So yeah, no, it's fixed. We don't have them anymore. Uh, what I also see is a lot of people that just say, okay, Jenkins, yeah, you know, it's just dev environment. So if it's done for one day, it's nothing. Uh, so you should really try to be in the mood that your CI server is considered as a production server. And it's no longer the one extra server that was left over that you say, okay, next to my Nexus, next to my, I don't know which other uh, software stack you have, I put my Jenkins or my CI server. You know, CI systems need to get more love and a manager should understand that this is very important to put uh, effort into your CI system as well. Also when it comes to environments, so yeah, we will build a development environment somewhere in a cloud so that developer will be able to run whatever they want. Uh, and then we will go to the acceptance so that uh, maybe your customers can validate the solution. And then we say, okay, we will have one server in acceptance so that yeah, it will be, you know, it will be the same distribution as uh, the production. It will be really fun, really great. It will work well. And if it works in acceptance, it will work in production. Except that on production, you have like 10 times more power, 10 servers, and you will run multiple instances of your server. And then you didn't realize that, yeah, they do not speak to each other. So that, yeah, you end up having problems in production just because your acceptance is not great. Just because you have such a huge gap between your acceptance, your test environment, and your production environment. So you should really try to uh, make them as close as possible and not try to mix them or to just have like something that will uh, be very, very uh, snowflake in production and in acceptance, like to very straightforward. You also have the problem of monitoring. I've told you we have really great monitoring tools. Uh, we have good integration into uh, libraries, into uh, uh, languages where you can just add your monitoring very easily, like GVM metrics, uh, Go garbage collection metrics. That's really easy, but it's more than that. It's also like, how do you get your business metrics into uh, your monitoring system? Like, uh, how are your partners behaving? Or is uh, the business doing? Do you get requests? Do you serve those requests? That kind of things. And that's still something that people don't care before they go live. Like, they go live and like they say, you know, on Monday we go live. Now we want some monitoring on it. And it's like, yeah, it's a bit too late to do that now. So you should really try to uh, include monitoring in the development. And somehow people are not doing that yet. And there are also some technologies like queuing systems, right? They've been there for multiple years, but still people don't use them enough. Like they try to do everything synchronously, like you get a request, you do it uh, immediately. And in some, some places, it just doesn't make sense. So you can just get a request, put it in a queue and deal with it later. And don't put that in a DB that you will uh, look every hour in a cron job, that kind of thing. No, use the proper system for the proper jobs. So it's really important that you also tackle uh, those stuff that there are some technologies available and don't try to uh, reinvent them or do uh, omit them because you will also uh, get a lot of extra work for you. Then there is uh, the data. Like, 
it's not the day you go in production that you should go to the production database and say, okay, I need to do that update in that table. Data migration is part of the development and it's really important to uh, understand that and that from the beginning, from the testing environment, you start and you really like um, uh, work with tools like Wikibase, that kind of things that can just help you migrate your data and think about the use cases. And when I say use data migration, it doesn't mean uh, throw a big SQL file and that will do it. No, it's really like uh, m uh, model your data and model your databases in a pretty nice way. And test that migration in depth, staging, production, any environment that you have so that it's not when you go in production that you will find out that eh, that's not going well. When is your own software also? Uh, you should consider that uh, you should work on your installation procedure. Like, you can do a lot of stuff with tools like Puppet or Ansible, but when you install your software, you should not have to touch the four different files, remove an extra file, change a version in another file to get your service started. So you should really embrace the PCS pattern. You should embrace uh, the correct way of doing software development. And you cannot call a software legacy if it has been running for like 10 years. Yeah, it's legacy, but you have time to improve it over those years. And if it's still going to be there for the next 10 years, yeah, you should definitely invest time into it so that you get better uh, install procedures that will be fast and more safe. Even if you can automate almost everything, yeah, you should just be uh, as simple as you can. So it's important to understand uh, that in modern, uh, in the modern data center, three people cannot manage uh, all the stacks out there. Three people is not enough to understand an OKVM, Ubuntu, OpenStack, Kubernetes cluster, from an Puppet, and anything that will come out of uh, uh, the current use and that's something that people tend to forget that like you know there are a lot of fancy tools there are a lot of useful tools and every day we see new tools coming up it doesn't mean that you should use them that you should embrace them and I should spend time uh, on all of them so you need to make choices and if you want to make less choices and to have more flexibility then you need to have a bigger team uh, that can actually handle that because just like putting all the burden on 20 people will limit their ability to uh, do their job correctly. And at the end, it's also important that inside your own code base, you take some attention to uh, follow uh, good design and that you can uh, make your job easier from the development until the operations. So it's important that inside your code base, you think about monitoring, you think about conflict management, and you have no excuses for not doing that after all these years and all the fantastic solutions that we have now. So it's really important that from the beginning, you really have conflict management in mind. And that was my message for today. Thank you.